Hello, I'm Tom Bosa. Today we are going to uh, demonstrate uh, the post-harvest uh, defects in our uh, grain. Crops like maize, uh, uh, sorghum, uh, pulses, uh, things like groundnuts, beans. So uh, what I have here in this tray is a sample of groundnuts which was uh, uh, bought from uh, one of our local markets. Uh, but before you, uh, before we go ahead to identify the different uh, defects of this uh, in, in this particular sample, let us appreciate the, just the appearance of the sample, how the sample appears on the shelf. You can see it has, uh, there are some whole grain, but you see there are some uh, broken grains. Uh, basically, just by appearance, uh, this sample is not uh, appealing uh, to the consumer. Okay? But just subjectively, the consumer will not uh, buy this sample. A serious consumer, especially if this is going to be exported by a serious uh, uh, company. Now, we should also be able to quantify these defects. And one of the things that you need to be able to quantify uh, the different uh, defects, you need to, to carry out some sampling. There are several other techniques sampling green, but for today we are going to demonstrate the quarter sampling technique. Keep your sample uh, on a flat surface. Uh, this is this tray is flat, or it could even be on the table. So after keeping your sample, uh, it must form a cone-like uh, structure, as demo as demonstrated here on this sheet of paper. This is a cone-like kind of structure, and then after that, you're going to to flatten. Okay. So you can use a ruler, something as uh, a ruler, like a, a ruler, something quite uh, with a small, with a thin, uh, which is quite thin. So you pass through a ruler carefully, so that you flatten, you make it uh, flat. Okay. So after flattening, um, just. Like you also see on this, this is a flat kind of cone. So after you flattened, you still use your ruler as your dividing uh, device or a tool. So you will divide this into four quarters, four equal sized quarters. So uh, first I divide into half. Okay. And then I carefully divide into uh, quarters. Okay. If you happen to have an equipment, equipment such as a, a, a sample divider or a refo kind of divider, this is simple. Just for the grain, that kind of equipment that just uh, 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 scatters the grain into uh, the different portions. Uh, but if you don't have such equipment, this is the simplest, the simple way. Uh, this is the simple way of uh, quartering. So now this is what we call quartering. I have divided the, that cone into four quarters. Um, so, the next step would be picking out a trundle. A trundle, you pick two opposite quarters. Okay? So, I will choose to pick this one. Okay? And this one. Okay? So, this quarter and this quarter is what I'm going to use as my uh, sample. And the rest. I'll put it aside. Okay. Now I can combine the two quarters. Okay. For me to be able to 
analyze the different uh, attributes, post uh, harvest attributes of grain. So this is our sample. Now, the first step, we are going to weigh uh, our sample. Uh, we shall use this polythene. But let's first uh, establish the weight of this polythene. Uh, the polythene weighs two grams. Okay, so we we now record the weight of the polythene. So the weight of the polythene is two grams. After which uh, we put our sample uh, into the polythene. Make sure that everything uh, you don't leave anything on the tray, including the small particles. I've removed everything. Uh, so our, uh, our balance will be zero. So I now uh, weigh, uh, take the weight of the sample together with the polythene. And the weight of the sample together with the polythene is uh, 195 grams. Okay. So for us to establish the actual sample weights, it is just a difference. We subtract two grams, the weight of the polythene, from the 195 grams. Therefore, uh, the weight of the sample will be 193 grams, 195 minus two, okay? Okay, so having established uh, the sample weights, we can now uh, go ahead and determine uh, the different parameters which determine the quality of grain. Uh, just like other foodstuffs, there's a standard for grain. Uh, we picked out a few of the parameters from the UNIB standards, which include um, uh, the moisture content of the grain, uh, looked at the appearance, are they shriveled, percentage of grains that is shriveled, uh, percentage of uh, rain matter, okay? So those are some of the parameters we are going to demonstrate here. Percentage of grain affected by insect damage, uh, the presence of split or broken grains. Okay, so those are basically some of uh, the key parameters we are going to demonstrate uh, using this sample. Let's get rid of this because we don't need it. We shall focus on our sample, uh, which we obtained from the sampling procedure. So for us to not get confused, let me remove this. So we can now focus on, on the sample that we've just measured. We said it was weighing 193 uh, grams. I've already mentioned some of the quality parameters uh, which were extracted from the UNB standards that we are going to uh, demonstrate today. Uh, but first of all, let's look at the appearance of this sample just before we even identify uh, those other blemishes. The sample clearly shows that it has many defects. I'm seeing a lot of uh, uh, foreign matter, for example, you see this, this looks like charcoal. Uh, there are some sticks. Uh, some grains are broken. Uh, some look shriveled. We're going to see uh, what shriveled grains look like. 
So this sample clearly has uh, several defects. So the ne our next step will be sorting. Okay, we are going to sort to be able to isolate, to quantify, to isolate and quantify uh, uh, the, 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 the different post-harvest uh, defects in this particular sample. Um, so I will spread this tray or spreading uh, makes it easy for me, makes it easy for you to see and uh, separate the bad grain from the good grain. Um, we have grain that one of, I already said that one of the parameters is broken grain. So we can sort out the broken grain, put it aside, okay? So you put the broken grain aside. Uh, I hope you already know what the possible causes of broken grain could uh, are. Uh, they will handle our grain. What causes broken? Uh, it could be uh, during transportation, uh, some of the grain uh, breaks during that stage. Uh, it could be uh, during uh, the handling process, the drying process, uh, some of the grain breaks could break in that process. Okay? So, uh, so this, these are just some of the broken grains. Uh, but I'll also be picking out the shriveled. Okay? Now, shriveled grains uh, have wrinkles on them, okay? I don't know whether you can see these. Let me put them aside here. They have wrinkles, they are wrinkled. Shriveling means they become small, but they are characterized by wrinkles. Uh, that is how you're able to identify them, separate them from the normal uh, grain. After the sorting procedure, uh, we have the broken grains right here. Then we have the shriveled. Uh, we have uh, foreign matter. Then we have other grains. Yeah, I see some rice grains. There's a bean seed and maize. Then I see uh, some grains that look diseased. Okay. And then there are grains that are simply discolored. So those are the uh, blemishes we've, we've been able to see. So next, we are going to determine, to quantify. Uh, so we shall weigh, again weigh, each of those, uh, each of those. So I'm going to use a moisture dish. So I put my moisture dish on the weighing scale and then zero, okay, so I press zero. So that means it reads zero, okay. I've reset it to zero. Now I'm going to take the weight of the broken uh, ground nuts. So the broken ground nuts are weighing 17 grams. The weight is 17 grams. The risk of having many brokens in your sample, you see, when they are broken, you're also exposing your grain to microbial uh, contamination. Um, so we have 17 grams, uh, which is broken. So if you want to, uh, to, 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 to calculate 
how much in terms of percentage, how much are the brokens? You express the 17 grams as a percentage of the original sample weight. Remember, our original sample weight was 193 grams. So therefore, our brokens we equal to 17 grams divided by 193 grams, okay, multiplied by 100. So it is 17 divided by 100, uh, divided by 93 times 100. So what we get will be the percentage of broken grain. Okay. Uh, next, we are going to uh, Okay, to, to already read the zero because I had already uh, set it at zero. So these are the wrinkled, uh, the shriveled grain. You can see they are wrinkled. Um, shriveled wrinkled because by many uh, factors, but one of the factors could be um, uh, premature grain. So shriveled is 8 grams, which therefore, in terms of percentage, would equate to 8 out of 93 times 100. Okay, so it is 8 grams divided by 93 times 100 uh, shriveled. Then next, as a foreign matter, Uh, foreign matter includes many things. I'm seeing stones, I'm seeing um, uh, remains of the husk after shelling. And it weighs two grams. Okay? So foreign matter is two grams. So two grams expressed as a percentage would be two out of 93 times 100. Uh, next is um, f uh, other grains. Would if, if somebody is buying ground nuts, we don't expect to find other grains there. So that in itself is a quality issue. Okay. So other grains, um, uh, it still reads zero grams because there were very few. Uh, uh, the kind of balance I have here is not sensitive enough to weigh, uh, to, to give us a value below uh, one gram. Okay. So we can say that other grains were not detectable. Okay, they are, they are less than one gram. Um, then here I have the diseased grain. Okay. And diseased grain uh, are one gram. So diseased is one gram. So it is one out of 93 times 100. One out of 193, not 93. Okay. Uh, everything is expressed as a percentage of 193, which was the original uh, sample weight. So that's one gram. And then lastly, we have a discolored uh, grain. And for discolored, uh, again, this, these were also very few. So you can say this was less than, uh, less than one gram. Okay, this was also very few. It was less than one gram. Um, for this particular sample, we did not see any insect damaged uh, grain. Um, I will show you one of the samples that we have. Uh, it's a maize sample. Uh, this sample has got significant uh, damage from insects, these are, I see, they are weevils, okay? 
uh, you see there is an insect moving. This is a live insect. We have some live insects. Some are dead. Okay? Even when you see dead insects, that is proof that there was a, a insect infestation. Then uh, most of the grain have got holes in them uh, due to uh, can I say burrowing of insects into the grain. Now these insects uh, lead to quantitative losses in that they feed on the grain, so you lose part of that grain. But also uh, in terms of in terms of quality. They feed on nutrients in the maize grain. So there is reduced quality in terms of nutrients and also in terms of appearance. Uh, nobody wants to buy maize grain that has holes in it, that has uh, insects, dead insects and insects, live insects uh, in it. Uh, nobody will be interested in um, buying maize that has uh, not seen any insect uh, droppings. But of, course, but of course, where they are insects, they, they, they excrete, they, they, they excrete in the produce, and all those are quality issues that need to be addressed. So, all this happens, especially during storage, uh, how our farmers uh, store uh, the maize, uh, they provide their condition, the storage conditions favor uh, growth of these insects, and this is what we are seeing today. So, uh, what again we need, just like we did for the other blemishes in groundnuts, again we ought to make to, 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 to weigh this and then express it as a percentage of the original sample weight of the maize. So, uh, we have our sorted. Uh, groundnut sample here. Uh, I want you people to, to to compare and contrast in terms of appearance. If if you had a choice uh, to buy to buy groundnuts, and this is what was presented. This is the original sample. Okay, and then. You also have this one, which has been sorted. Which one would you go for? The answer lies, uh, lies with you. But clearly, this, is, this looks a better sample, uh, a better uh, product as compared to this one. Um, yeah, so. Basically, our traders, our, especially the people, uh, the farmers and especially traders, retailers and wholesalers, uh, they need to appreciate uh, good, better post-harvest handling practices if they want their produce uh, to be valued by customers. Uh, uh, some in some produce, for example, it is common, especially in maize, you find that if maize is not sorted, the price is different from the price when the product is sorted. So that clearly shows that uh, the, quality, the sorting and grading of your grain has got an economic uh, factor attached to it. In fact, there is an economic loss if you don't uh, sort and grain uh, and grade your uh, grain uh, as required by the standard. When it comes to exports, uh, there is no uh, there is no place for such a product on the export market. Uh, the other parameter we've not yet uh, looked at is moisture content. Of course, we picked out a few uh, parameters. There is a list. Uh, uh, I will request you to check, uh, to look out for the UNBS standard for grain. Uh, so we are going to uh, also demonstrate how to measure moisture content. Next, after quarter sampling, uh, the next thing is to determine the quality parameters that affect the grade 
or no grain, whether it is maize or beans or groundnuts. And um, one of such parameters is the uh, water activity and moisture content. Uh, but we're going to start with water activity. Um, what I what you see here with me is a uh, water activity meter. Uh, it's a water activity uh, meter, and this is what I'm going to use to measure uh, water activity from these uh, uh, samples. Now, I, I hope you know what water activity means and what uh, the significance is. Uh, water activity basically gives you an idea about how much uh, water is available for microbial activity uh, uh, in, in your food sample. So basically, it, it gives it from, from the microbial and safety point of view, water activity uh, becomes more relevant as compared to just determining the moisture content. Uh, so I've, 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 I've done, I've finished water sampling, uh, and I'm now starting with uh, uh, moisture content. So this water activity uh, meter has got a grain cup uh, where you apply the sample. So this is the grain cup. So I will, uh, I get a bit of the sample and pour in the grain cup. Uh, until level, okay, and then um, I immediately, uh, in case of delays, I try to cover and cover with another cup, just to avoid uh, entry of moisture content, moisture from the surroundings, which could affect water activity. So I remove this base. Uh, this base is magnetic; it attaches itself to the project bar. So this is where. So within this base, there is a compartment, a sample uh, chamber, where I insert the rain cup containing the sample. Okay, so I have my sample in there. Now, I insert this, the base, back, and then I'll press the on button. It's the on button, and the moment you press the on button, it gives you two values. One value is, the first value is the water activity, and the second value is the temperature. So, the water activity of this particular sample is 0 0.65. This was a sample of uh, uh, yellow maize or popcorn. Okay? So, I'm going to record this. Uh, it is 0. Point 64. Uh, the reason it records both water and temperature because we know that uh, temperature can also affect water activity because it can cause variation in moisture contents in the samples. So I get this out. I guess I, I don't have to switch off because I'm going to return in other samples. So I'm going to run a duplicate. Um, so I pour this here. So I'm going to run um, a duplicate. This is the same sample. Don't have to, to wipe. Okay. Uh, place in the uh, base and then. Uh, okay. So I'm going to put it there. Wait for it to stabilize. This one when it stops uh, moving when the value becomes constant. Uh, that is your water activity. So water activity of this particular one is 0 0.64. Okay? 0 0.64. Change it to the same. 0 0.63 not 64. So I have two values, uh, 0 0.63 and 0 0.64. So I'm going to do the same with the other samples. Uh, so all these samples are finished with the water sample. Uh, but before applying the next sample, I wipe with a, a dry piece of tissue. 
uh, so that I'm not contaminating my next sample with moisture from uh, the previous sample. So the next sample is going to be a sample of uh, it's a sample of uh, beans number that I can do a duplicate. Um, it just has to be level. clean this uh, to get rid of any moisture. Then um, I'll pick a few grains. Remember I did water sampling already. So I'll pick a few grains. Uh, that will be uh, just level. Um, i put the grain cup chamber here and then attach this to the measuring unit press on and there you go so for dinners uh, first sample is 0 0.6 uh, it has wait for it to stabilize 0 0.64 0.64 uh, so 0 0.64 so uh, off again. Uh, next sample. Next uh, will be replicates. Uh, uh, place in the sample chamber. Okay. Uh, it gives you zero points. Uh, zero point six. Uh, zero point six four. Okay. Um, so get this off. Okay, so the next sample is going to be a sample of, uh, of white maize grain. Uh, so I'll still clean this a little bit and then uh, apply a sample of maize. Okay, so the same uh, procedure, then switch on, and there you go, uh, for maize the first result is zero point, uh, I'm still waiting, still running, still running, so you wait for it to stabilize, when it becomes stable, that is when you Take the reading. So it is 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.57. Okay. So it reads 0 0.57. So switch off. It is still 0 0.57. Zero point five seven. Okay, you can see that uh, this white maze is has a lower water activity. It is really dry as compared to the other the first samples measured. So the duplicates the next one. Um, uh, so you press on. Again wait for it to stabilize. Uh, still So have zero point zero point five five seven zero point five seven. So it is 
Sam. So you wait for about 30 seconds to 1 minute. You still have 5, 6, then that's the value. So have you have 5, 6. Okay. So our next our uh, duplicate reads 0 0.5, uh, 6. Okay, so uh, we are done with base. The next sample will be uh, a sample of sorghum. Also take note, I don't have to touch here, you shouldn't touch the sample of your own hands because your hands will add moisture to the sample which may affect our results. So uh, that is the uh, duplicate for sorghum, it's still running, uh, 0 0.5, 7, I So our uh, water activity is 0 0.55. 0 0.55. Yes, so 0 0.5. 5. So this is the water activity of sorghum. So um, having determined the water activity, uh, we can next uh, going forward we are going to uh, uh, determine the moisture content as well. Uh, and also uh, determine other parameters, other physical parameters that affect the grade of your grain, uh, such as for rain matter, whether the grain is broken, in, in some of those parameters uh, which uh, are, in, are part of the standards uh, for grain. Uh, otherwise, uh, that is that is it for water activity. Uh, for moisture uh, content, we are going to use the oven uh, method, which is one of the AOSC approved methods for determining moisture in food samples. Um, first, you precondition the moisture dishes. Uh, this means that after you wash the moisture dishes and then dry them. Uh, you put them in the oven at 100 uh, degrees Celsius and dry them uh, for about uh, two hours. Okay, so after drying the, the, uh, the moisture dishes, it implies that they are now completely free 
of moisture either from the surroundings or even the wash water that we used uh, during the washing. So that is what we call preconditioning because you do not want uh, external moisture content to be to, to interfere with the actual moisture content of the sample. Now, after you have uh, dried the moisture dishes, you remove them from the oven and transfer them into um, a desiccator. You leave them in the desiccator to cool, uh, cooling normally about between 15 to 20 minutes uh, is the time you need of the moisture dishes to cool. Um, and definitely, uh, 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 the desiccator also has got um, uh, a silica component at the base which absorbs any remaining moisture content and any moisture that could have uh, gotten onto the dishes during the process of transfer. Um, at the end of that process, the next thing will be to, to now get ready, to, to now weigh, uh, take the weight of a moisture dish. Um, so uh, you must be ready with your sample. So we have our sample here. Uh, to the sample of uh, ground nuts. Um, so the first thing is to weigh the preconditioned moisture dish. Um, these moisture dishes already have labels on them. Uh, they were labeled before preconditioning. So uh, the balance is already at zero. So I put my moisture dish to the balance. Again, I still use a pair of tongs to transfer from uh, uh, the desiccator to the balance because of the reason I already talked about. So um, the weight of the moisture dish is 4.29 uh, uh, 62. So after recording the weight of the moisture dish, uh, the procedure says you weigh two to five grams of your sample. So if if my weight is 4.29, um, I'm going to I'll be weighing three grams. Um, that will come to about um, 7.29. So again, I weigh using um, a spatula. I transfer using a spatula. That is around 7.30. Okay, close to 7.29. Uh, now next, I record the weight the weight of the sample together with the moisture dish before drying. So, and it is 7.0042. So after uh, I've done that, then I can transfer this. Uh, I can put it aside. And then do the same for the other moisture dishes. We normally uh, 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 do measurements in triplicates. Um, or we replicate our measurements. Uh, so this weight is 4.1939. Um, putting 3 grams. Um, about 3 grams. That makes it 7. Point. Okay, that's a lot. Put a lot. So that is 7.2. Okay, 7.2021. That's about 3 grams. 2031. Uh, again, I put this aside. Remember, do not forget to record uh, to record the the code, the dish code. Okay. This moisture, I can now touch after weighing, it is okay. These moisture dishes have codes on them. This one is B2, so I need to record B2, okay. Uh, this one was uh, 19, so I record 19. Because at the end of that day, you must be able to identify these moisture dishes uh, from the oven, as we shall see. Uh, so, weighing the last one for this sample. Uh, 
7.4 okay so weight of moisture dish plus sample 7.4135 um, so for this particular one the code is uh, code is uh, it is zero okay the code of zero Now, after uh, causing the weight of the moisture dishes plus the samples, next we shall transfer these moisture dishes back to the oven. Again, the oven must have been preset at 100 degrees Celsius. They will stay in the oven for uh, a procedure says between 18 to 24 hours. So we we'll dry them for 18 hours in the oven. Yeah, so after drying our sample for 18 hours in the oven, um, uh, and we've now transferred them to the desiccator, uh, uh, wait for them to cool. So after they have cooled, cooling uh, uh, takes 15, 20 minutes, just like before. Uh, I reweigh each of the same of this, each each of these dishes together with the sample after drying. So I reweigh and then record the weight. Remember, don't forget the code. The dish code, for example, in this case that is B2. So I record where I recorded B2. So that will be the weight of the moisture dish plus the sample after drying. Okay? So I do the same all the other uh, moisture dishes. Okay. So that is the second weight. Uh, that was 19. Okay. I'm going to record that. And then the last, um, last one. Last one, um, it was O, oh, so we also need to record that weight after uh, drying. So the next step will be calculation, okay, where you express the loss in moisture as a percentage of the original sample weight. Well, well I had already mentioned that moisture context is one of the uh, parameters in the UNB standards, uh, but it's there for a reason. Uh, the higher the moisture content in your grain, the higher the likelihood of uh, micro, the higher likelihood of microbial growth. Because normally, the higher the moisture content, the higher the, the water activity, which we have also measured. When you have a high moisture content, there is a high likelihood that your water activity is also high. Water activity basically refers to how much water is available for microbial activity. So, the higher the moisture content, the higher the likelihood of microbial activity in your grain. That decreases the shelf life of your, the storage life of your grain. You have molds coming in, you have uh, uh, bacterial, uh, bacteria growth as well. So, uh, that is one of the reasons why we are interested why uh, standards, uh, standard uh, officers have to enforce the moisture standard as well. Um, the standard stipulates, um, uh, has a, the standard for grain has a stipulated moisture content for these dry products, okay, which you will check for in that UNBS standard, and that has to be related. Uh, one of the other reasons is in terms of um, um, in terms of the economic uh, the economic uh, losses uh, 
moisture when it comes to business uh, will increase the weights of, of, your, of your produce. For example, if I have groundnuts that contain, if for every 100 uh, kilograms of groundnuts, 20, uh, 20 kilograms is moisture content, that means a trader is buying 20 kilograms of just water. Okay? So, that would be cheating when it comes to the side of the trader. And that is why this moisture content has to be standardized. Yeah. Basically, those are some of uh, uh, the, the reasons why this uh, parameter is particularly important because an, an economic loss is, stems from uh, the moisture content mm -hmm. being high. Mm -hmm.